All right, we're in part two of Sermon on the Mount, chapter six. You don't have to get worried till next week when it's chapter seven, okay? And we've got some pretty challenging stuff going on in chapter six. It talks about giving to the poor and praying. Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who's in heaven. So when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the street, so that they can be honored by men. <clears throat> I tell you, they have their reward in full. But when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand's doing, so that your Father will so that your giving will be in secret, and your Father who sees what's done in secret will reward you. Now, this is important. Back in the day, the Pharisees liked everybody to know how religious they were, and so they took the opportunity to put their religious activities and behavior out for everybody to see. And the truth of the matter is, you and I play to an audience of one. Remember that. The one you care about, the the opinion that matters, is the Lord. Does it really matter what other people think about you? What matters is what he thinks about you. And, And we're supposed to practice our righteousness. Practice is the habits that you have. That you are in the habit of right living before God. That's your habit. Now, sometimes we have some bad habits. Sometimes we have some bad seasons. Sometimes we have some... Bad days. But on the whole, we ought to be about practicing habits of goodness and spiritual depth. And notice something it says. It says, when you give to the poor. It doesn't say, if you give to the poor. When you give to the poor. This is important. We've got the Hope Center on 192. We've got missions that we do. You cross the paths of people that are in need all the time. Some of you have other mission ministries in your life. I think I've shared with you before, I've told my son, there's three things you've got to do. You've got to read your Bible, you've got to take care of the poor, and you've got to eat your vegetables. Okay? And, and don't brag about what you do. It's supposed to be a lifestyle. And I was talking to my best friend about something that I was doing, not bragging, just telling him the facts. Okay? And he says, you know, you give to feel good about yourself. It's always the best friend to make you feel bad about yourself. And I said, no, I don't feel good about myself. It's actually inconvenient. And often when I give, I have an attitude because I had plans for that money. And it's, it's going to mess with my schedule that I have to go out of my way to take care of this need. And I, I, I don't feel good about myself when I do it. I do it because that's the Christian lifestyle. That's just how we live. People cross our path, we take care of it. So, of course... He was understanding and encouraging, and he said, so you do it for a reward. I said, well, no. Um, I'm already going to heaven in spite of what I do. I'm afraid I have more sins of omission than I, I would like to admit. I've missed lots of opportunities to be a blessing. And, and really, again, um, My reward, I'm so worried about getting to the next level of my sanctification journey. I'm not thinking about polishing my halo. I'm just doing the lifestyle of Jesus Christ. Don't think about the reward. Don't feel good about myself. I'm not even trying to please God. Because in that relationship with God, I'm just lost in his forgiveness and love. I don't think in terms of, ooh, this ought to be a a, a green gem. 
in the crown. Okay? I just think in terms of, wow, maybe this will leave the fingerprints on Jesus and somebody else will have their burdens lifted off of them and the good news will take place in their life. And that's where we ought to be. We play to that audience of one. It's a conversation. It's a relationship. It's an agenda. I like to say you and I as Christians should be about the family business, which is extending grace and changing lives and touching people for Jesus Christ. We don't do this to be honored by men. And he says, you're giving in secret. Um, your father sees what you do in secret, and he's going to reward you. Now, let's be honest. For those of us who tithe, it's not easy. And for those of us who tithe, we tithe if you ask a tither. I'm going to say 7 out of 10 will say, if you tithe, it comes back to you. Okay? And yes, it does. God has a way of pouring the financial blessings on you. Sometimes they're not financial blessings. Sometimes they're health blessings. Sometimes it's coverage in the family. Sometimes it's the miraculous showing up. Sometimes you give, and that year you have a lean year. But when you're having a lifetime with God, a lean year doesn't mean much. You follow me? See, we give because we're in that ongoing relationship. And some years we get blessed. Some years we don't, but we don't do it for the blessing. We do it because we are in a relationship with God, and he runs our lives. And truthfully, would you like to have the gracious, good, living God running your life? Or would you like to have your sinful self in charge of things? Sinful self, lots of mistakes and heartache. Gracious, living God, even the heartache have a beautiful edge to it. Well, let's talk about giving. Should we always give in secret? I'm going to say no. I'm thinking about Barnabas. In Acts 4, he gave a piece of property. He brought it to the church. He said, I'm selling this property so we could take care of the poor and feed people and clothe them and, and show the love of Jesus Christ. And what he did inspired lots of other people to give. Not only then, but down through the millennia. We read about Barnabas doing that. We go, wow. So we can give property too. But the very next chapter is Ananias and Sapphira. The man says to the woman, okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to sell our property for this price but we're going to say we sold it for that price, and they're going to think we're really holy and special, and they're going to really be impressed by our spirituality. Well, guess what? The Holy Spirit told on them. And so when Ananias comes in and Peter says, did you sell it for this price? He goes, I did. Drops dead. The wife comes in, not knowing what happened to her husband. Did you sell it for this price? Yes, we did. Drops dead. Ouch. Unfortunately, the wrong motives. To look righteous. They, they already would have looked good for selling it. You see how the inner life is important? And I want to talk about that. It says, the father who sees in secret. What's your secret life like? What's your secret thought life like? What are your secret habits like? What's that conversation with God? A lot of times, for me, it's like this. You know, I, I, I have this relationship with God. I'm excited. I like to talk about him and share how he moves in my life. But then I go in my secret life, and I'm like, you know, God, I'm struggling with so-and-so. And that's a place where I can be honest. That's a place where I can be vulnerable. That's a place where I can admit attitude and mistakes and failures and hopes and dreams it's a safe place you don't have to play games there and it's kind of like when you go to counseling the more you're willing to lay out the more healing the therapist is going to bring to your life the more you're willing to lay before the lord 
the more he's going to be able to heal and bring wholeness to you. The secret life. And again, Jesus says when you pray, uh, don't be like the hypocrites. Uh, they love to stand in the synagogues and have everybody admire them. And they would make prayers that would be so eloquent and beautiful. Mean what you say. Better say, Lord, I'm struggling with a bad attitude today. Than to say, Lord, thank you for sanctifying my attitude. Okay? Just be honest. Mean what you say. He says, when you go to prayer into your inner room, this is your private chamber. Now, we've talked about this more than once before. Where's your prayer spot? Do you have one? If you don't, that's your assignment. Go establish one where you talk to God. Whether you get on your knees or you sit on your couch, I want your Bible there with a pencil so you can underline and circle. I want a pillow there if you're going to get on your knees so that you don't have to get knee surgery in 10 years. You need to have a place where you go meet with God. It could be when you walk down the certain path. For some of you, it's when you drive to work. But you need to have that place where you talk to God. I, I don't know if I told you about this one woman. I went to her house, and she had a wine cellar that she turned into a prayer closet. Wow. I was thinking she could have just had a prayer closet in the wine cellar and had communion all the time, right? <laughs> but she didn't see it that way. And when he, he says more about prayer, don't use meaningless repetition. How we say the same thing, Lord, I thank you for this and I thank you for that and give me this and give me that and, you know, I don't know. It's not supposed to be the same old thing like we say at the, the grace over dinner. Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest and let this food to us be blessed. That's what my Lutheran wife would say, okay? Uh, mine was more, um, Lord... Thanks for the grub. Um, there we go. And I would always make the kids, all right, it's your turn to pray. Big mistake. Because you set the food out, and the five-minute prayer would ensue. Okay? Because then you're all excited that they're going to pray. Oh, listen, you know, she's learning how to pray. And, Oh, let me pray again. And the next thing you know, that 30-second prayer is now in a minute and a half. And all of a sudden, it's becoming a four-minute prayer. And suddenly, come, Lord Jesus, be our guest. was sounding pretty good. But here's what I really want to say. The, the repetition, it's important if it puts you in a place where you can let your thoughts go with God. It's not so good. If you're just doing the Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You know, sometimes we do it in church and, and it goes so fast that I can't even say it. it, it it's, it's just repetition. We're scooting over the words. And, and it's interesting because Jesus says this. He says, your Father knows what you need before you ask. What's the normal question? then why ask? If he already knows what I need, why should I bother him? Well, that's a misunderstanding of what prayer is. Prayer is not the Christmas list. Prayer isn't where you say, Lord, give me this and give me that and take care of this and take care of that. Prayer is where you go to before the Lord and you have a relationship. There's communication. A lot of times I'll go to prayer and I'll say, Lord, I need you to open this door for, for our church. And as I lay that out there and I pause and think about it, suddenly God gives me insights that I didn't have about that door and what's on the other side or how to get through that door or why I might want to go through that other hallway. Sometimes I go to prayer and I get an assignment. See, it's not just about my list. It's about communication because a lot of times he clarifies, he alters. 
He brings grace to somebody you were hoping was going to get struck by lightning. And then asks you to be the one to deliver the grace for him. You're like, whoa, wait a minute. I came there hoping they were going to get theirs, and now you want me to bring peace to them. That's what happens in prayer. Maybe that's why we don't like to go to prayer. Because God does a lot of heart work in that conversation. And, and that's where we get to the, the Lord's Prayer. I don't know why we call it the Lord's Prayer. It should be called the Disciples' Prayer because um, the disciples said, Lord, teach us how to pray. And Jesus says, um, <clears throat> Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts, sins, as we forgive our debtors or those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And then we added, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. That God added around 300 AD, okay? So if you decide not to say it, you're being biblical, right? Seventy words, six petitions, three that focus on God, three that focus on us. Now, it's important that you know that Jesus couldn't have prayed this prayer because he doesn't have any sins to be forgiven of. The disciples said, teach us to pray. He showed us what to do. Unfortunately, we've taken the prayer and turned it into vain repetition because, like I said, we can pray it so fast in even a church service that we just go cruising past the word, missing the meaning. And what really needs to happen is we slow down and taste each word, and concept, and theme. And, and it's a lot of fun. The first one is God, our Father. Jesus refers to the Father 150 times in the gospel. Father, brand new concept. The Jews didn't even like to call on the name of God by 300 B.C. because they might blaspheme. On Sunday service a couple of weeks ago, I talked about the, the Muslims. They will not pray. Father, that's blasphemous. Jesus comes along, and not only does he say Father, he says call him Abba, which is Daddy. Whoa! <coughs> that's, um, that would be so startling to the Jews to, 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 to hear this. But, but you have to understand, Father, this is the power source. This is the authority. This is the one who used to make it happen. Now, we live in a day and age where women sometimes run the household. Like in my house. Okay? There's a lot of single moms out there. There's a lot of breadwinners out there. Okay? So this is a very unique concept for society. Our, ours is. It's, 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 uh, it's a good one. The Proverbs 31 woman is easily the woman who knows how to take care of business. And if her husband was wise, he'd stay out of her way and just resource her so she could keep the household running in a good way. But, but so often we approach Heavenly Father, Almighty. Um, it could be Daddy. Because Daddy kind of puts you in a different kind of relationship. You know, I remember my kids going through that stage where they tried different names out on me. I went from Daddy to Mr. Lewis, <laughs> William, Pastor. I said, that's Reverend Doctor to you, okay? <laughs> Daddy is the person you go to to solve your problems. And our Father, who art in heaven, and, and here's where we make a big mistake. Who art in heaven? We think he's way up there. And, and we talk to him like he's up there, and you feel like he could just go, yeah, what do you need? He's right here. There's a beautiful passage in John 17, 3. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, 
in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. We keep hoping for that day when we get to eternal life. Eternal life happens the moment when you get into that conversation with God. Eternity, heaven, is on. Our Father who art in heaven, guess what? Heaven's that close. Hallowed be thy name. Okay, this is all about respect. And, and, and this is important because before you go to a prayer, you need to think about who you're talking to. Not so much this guy you need to be afraid of. You know why you don't need to be afraid of him anymore? Because of the cross. Everything that would render you to be scared of him has been removed because Jesus took all the sins that get in the way between you and God, died for them, transferred his righteousness to you. So when we come to him, it's not out of fear as much as, wow, you did that for me? I, I'm, I'm honored. I'm, I'm overwhelmed. I'm ashamed. I'm, I don't know what to say. I'm speechless. You come to this God who's done so much for you. And when you focus on a God that cares about you that intensely, a God who orchestrates the heavens and the earth, the God that can manipulate hearts and minds and circumstances, when you think about who he is, it's going to empower your prayer life. Sometimes we take it a little too casually. And, and it's good to be casual with God. It is that close and intimate. But let's not forget, he is almighty God. And how do we pray, thy kingdom come? What does that mean? Setting up a world where there's no sin? Not going to happen. Thy kingdom come happens inside of your hearts. It's when the Jesus spirit rests within you. And I'm going to ask, has that happened? Are you open to it? Are you inviting his spirit to come in and set up shop so his kingdom, thy will, not my will, is what's taking place in your life? Because when thy kingdom comes, that's when thy will gets done. And thy will is a challenge because, to be honest, I kind of like my will. And when thy will and my will get into an argument, um, well, that's the arm wrestling match that all of us have to go through. Surrendering what we want for what he wants. Maybe he wants you to forgive somebody. Maybe he wants you to care for somebody. Maybe he wants you to hand over a bad habit or a bad way of thinking. Maybe he wants you to start doing something that people need a touch from him and you're the fingerprints he wants to use. Okay? Instead of give me, bless me, protect me, it's God, here am I, use me. And friends, I got to tell you, sometimes he wants to use you in awkward situations. Sometimes the Nazis come to town and you get thrown into a concentration camp and that's where he wants thy will to take place through your life. Lots of Jews gave their lives to Jesus Christ in the concentration camps because Christians were willing to say, well, I don't like it, but I'm going to share my faith. Suddenly sharing your faith at work and the school isn't so intimidating, is it? If Christians can do it there, we ought to be able to do it where we're at right now. And how do we know his will? Reading the Bible. I'm always leaning on you. Are you in the Bible? Chapter a day. Are you in the Bible? Circling and letting the word of God. Slowing down enough to let the word of God speak to you. Because he'd like to address a situation in your life. He'd like to address that awkward conversation you had with somebody. He'd like to challenge you to see an opportunity. You can't do that if you're just trying to get through the chapter so you can go to bed. But if you slow down and let him speak, now you've got the living God using the living word to get into your living soul so that life will be coming through you to others. And I want to say this, the inclination of the heart determines how many ways God will speak to you. He'll speak to, to you through your friends, through your circumstances. He'll speak to you through people you wouldn't expect him to speak to you through. 
But know this, he wants to speak to you. He wants your attention. And, and I know this, this is the one thing I know about God's will. It's usually away from my will. I saw this book on the, on the shelf the other day. The Bait of Satan. My rights. Whenever somebody infringes upon our rights, what happens? We get upset about it. The hair gets up on the back of our neck. They've crossed me. And now you are ready to step forward on your behalf. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 get out of the way. This is an opportunity for me to step through you. So be careful about that. And when you and I focus on blessing others, I don't know what how, I don't know how to explain it, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Put him first. Everything you're concerned about comes your way. And that leads us to the next three petitions. Um, our needs. Okay? A lot of folks say, well, you know, I don't pray for me because, well, you know. God cares about other people. He cares about you. He died on the cross for you. He put his Holy Spirit inside of you. He wants to have a personal relationship with you. Of course he cares for you. He promises to meet your needs. Ask. You do not have because you do not ask. Okay? And the first thing we're supposed to ask for is our daily bread. Now, for the ancient world, that meant your food. Okay? This is our daily necessities. Right? Um, it's hard sometimes. A lot of people think this is the kitchen prayer. Like the little boy who didn't want to pray over his food. Because haven't we prayed over this three times already? Okay. It's leftovers. He was done praying for him. <laughs> and, and your basic existence. Okay? It's daily. Daily contact with God. The daily issue at work. The daily battle within yourself, the daily relationship with your spouse and kids and friends, whatever it is, daily, okay? And, and it's our bread, not my bread. Guess what? We don't get to live for ourselves. We live to be a blessing. We live in community. A lot of Christians, you know, I, I got my personal relationship with God and I'm good. It's not the way it's supposed to be. That's a very self-oriented way of doing life. When you go to, if you don't go to church, then you don't worship him. You don't get moved on through the body. You don't hear a sermon. You don't get the offering plate passed. It's just, hey, thanks for the salvation. And, and that's not what Christianity is supposed to be. It's our bread. And friends, I need to tell you something, that when you get in an argument with another Christian, you can't pray that they get theirs. You can't pray that you get to pull one over on them because that person matters to God. And the best you can do is say, Lord, release your grace and transform their lives and help them see what a horrible heartache they've caused me. Okay? It's about as good as it gets. But you can't wish the bad for them because they belong to God. And, and so that's when you deny your rights and ask God, all right. Unfortunately, I'm being used right now in a way I don't prefer to be. So you handle it correctly. God gets pleased. And he, he does. He blesses you. He responds to you. And here's the hard one. Forgive us our debts. Now what must we do before we have our sins forgiven? We must sin. And unfortunately, that's not a problem for any of us. We sin. Um, sin's a problem. We minimize it. Oh, it's it's uh, not meeting our human potential. Oh, we made a mistake. We weren't well informed. We have all these ways of minimizing sin. And friends, sin is evil, and it's so bad that Jesus had to die on the cross for it. It's bad. And And... The prayer that you and I are supposed to do is forgive us our debts, realize that you live in need of God forgiving you. Remember when David sinned with Bathsheba? Um, he said, against thee and thee only I have sinned. Well, what about Uriah the Hittite? You see, God is the one who uses the word sin 
You're accountable to God. It's his idea. And when you sin, it's between you and him. Yes, he wants you to turn around and forgive and, and restore and ask forgiveness. But you have a relationship with God. And here's the catch. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And suddenly, I have a responsibility. I've got to forgive somebody. Now, you need to know this is not a conditional clause. If I don't forgive, God won't forgive me. No. This is what, I believe this is what the Lord is saying. Because he's not going to tally our sins and, and figure out, did we forgive as much as we needed forgiveness? Well, never, that's going to be a losing tally for you. It's, are we taking on God's personality? Are you willing to release other people the way God has released you? And I have a feeling that everybody in here has somebody that's done us wrong, hurt our hearts, stole our money, hurt us physically. Guess what? It's so foundational that Jesus says forgiveness is a requirement. You got to let God's spirit, where you receive it, extend it to others. Now, I know I'm getting personal. I hope I'm getting personal. Because I want you to take that one person that you don't ever want to forgive and put them before the Lord right now and say, wow, you ask a lot. And he says, I know. I gave a lot. Do that so that this person doesn't have power over your life anymore. Let me have the power over your life to free the offense and get you rolling. Well, lead me not into temptation. The Lord's not going to lure us into temptation. If you lead me not, that means what? Lead me away from, right? Lead us not into temptation means make sure you guide me away from mismanaging situations that I could easily mismanage. People get all upset and excited about that. Well, I didn't mean to spend so much time on the Lord's Prayer. Let me just keep rolling. Whenever you fast, you know what fasting is? It's when you don't eat so that you can get focused on the Lord. Now, for some of us, a fast, yeah, I need to go on a diet. No, 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 no. This isn't about losing weight. This is about denying yourself so that you can fight for someone in prayer, so that you can focus on something that you want God to do in your life, so that you can surrender something to God. It's when we choose not to eat so that we're instead, you, 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 every time you get hungry, it becomes a prayer. And it's the wildest experience when your stomach starts to growl and you take it and direct it towards the Lord. It's, it's a unique experience. I, I don't know how many of you, I used to fast. And uh, I, I don't anymore because I have to take a pill every day. And kind of interesting, huh? How we, well, I'd like to fast, but I have to take a pill, God. So uh, I guess I could take the pill at the end of the day, huh? Never thought about that. Um, do you want something from God real badly? Are you willing to pray hard for it? Are you willing to fast? Do you want to hear his will? Don't store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy. Okay? Store up for yourself treasures in heaven. You know, God talks about money 800 times in the Bible. 800 times! Wow! Because the right attitude towards your money... There's a difference between a mature Christian and an immature Christian. And, and here's the deal. Americans, you know, we're brought up in capitalism. This is the most greedy society that's ever been. And you need to know something. The Bible doesn't encourage poverty, and the Bible doesn't condemn wealth. Well, maybe it does. 
It condemns mismanaging our wealth when we spend it only on us and not on others. Here's how you know if you're in a good spot financially. Are you giving regularly? Well, I can't. You see, I got credit cards. and Well, so you mismanage your credit cards and God's got to pay for it? Because if I've noticed something, that's like, what, 12 years to get out of credit card debt? So you're going to give to God in 12 years? What if you started giving to God and saying, hey, can you help me get out of credit card debt? Suddenly he shows up, okay? I'm not trying to manipulate to give right now. I just want you to understand, as a Christian, is there any part of your finances that go to build the kingdom of God and spread the gospel message? Is there any sacrificial part where you say, wow, God's ministry means so much to me that I'm going to not get a new car because I want to see the church get their pastor a new car. Ooh. Thank you. <laughs> you can't serve two masters. And, and really, this is where it gets personal. Because you live to get ahead, and you live to get your retirement in a good spot. You live because you want to enjoy life more. But here's the problem. You start to live for those selfish reasons rather than living to be a blessing. Those selfish reasons, they're not unacceptable they just need to be secondary to living for Jesus Christ. And, and it's so wild because in the scripture right here, it goes from talking about money to talking about worrying. Now, what do we worry about a lot? Our money. Isn't that wild? Okay, don't be worried about your life, what you're going to eat or drink, your body, what you're going to put on it. Life's more important than food and clothing. Don't, don't worry about this basic stuff. God's going to take care of you. And, and when you and I worry, we're basically insulting God that we don't trust that he's going to handle our problems and care for us. It's an insult. Because he does care about you. And he does want to bless your life. Okay? Don't worry about stuff. Just decide to trust him. It says, you seek first the kingdom of God, his righteousness. All these things are going to be added unto you. I've got a lot to say about worry, and I think I'm out of time. I think we kill ourselves between yesterday's regrets and tomorrow's worries. And how many worriers are there here today? I'm not asking to see your hands. But, you know, we live on the edge. We're ready to snap. We're overwhelmed. We're concerned about our health. We're worried about our finances. We're all stressed out. And a lot of times we worry about stuff that doesn't happen. Okay? Here's what I want you to know. You belong to a God who's got you covered. And here's where we make our mistakes. When we disengage and sometimes plug in and sometimes don't, it's when we're unplugged. Is that not when worry just gets the best of us? If we stay plugged in, then we always have his thoughts there to remind us. It's kind of fun. 366 times it says fear not in the Bible. It's even got the leap year covered. Right? 366 times. Don't fear. And I think if we remind ourselves, if we focus on him, if we remember how much he loves us, okay? Well, I've got a lot to say, but I feel like I'm out of time. I guess I do want to say this. In Psalm 103, 7, it says, The children of Israel knew the acts of God, but Moses knew the ways of God. And, and what a powerful statement. You see, we can know about God, or we can personally know God. They knew the acts of God. You know what that means? That the children of Israel lived from one miracle to the next. But they never developed a relationship with God in between miracles. They never gave them their heart over to him. They never decided to trust him. Every time there was a new problem, they grumbled. Whew. You got a problem? 
Do you immediately start grumbling? Or do you decide to praise the Lord? I got an opportunity to exercise my faith. I have an opportunity to trust God. Do you know how, you know what would happen to your problems if you decided not to worry about them and you decided to praise God? First of all, Satan would quit attacking you because, man, every time I attack, he just starts praising God. Okay? And also the Lord would say, wow, I got a believer who really believes that I'm going to care for them. And, and that's going to move his heart. He moves towards faith. It warms his heart. It moves his hand. And friends, he really wants to care for you. Well, I could go on and on. The, the statement of the day is this. Seek first his kingdom, his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. When you're giving, when you're praying, your money, your worries, everything about your life, you focus on him and let him take care of you. You focus on his stuff and he's going to take care of your stuff. Heavenly Father, what a joy to be here tonight. It's kind of a powerful passage, a little convicting. And we would like to invite the Holy Spirit into our souls and into our heads so that you would not merely be our Lord in terminology, but our Lord in in the way we live our lives. That you'd intersect our thoughts. That you would guide our path. That you would change our forgiving patterns. That you'd come alive in ways we never imagined so that not only we would experience you afresh, but other people would too. Put a blessing on everybody here. Heal them. Guide them. Care for them. In Jesus' name. Amen.